Good morning, everybody. Hey, you guys. It's good to see you. I know I got to hug most of you today, and it's so good that you came out, not just on this rainy day, but post, for getting to post COVID. And for all of you at home, we, um, we welcome you, and I don't think they're online, Sam. It's a red light. So yeah, that means we're live. Yeah. Oh, that does mean we're so sorry. We're live. We're live. Well, welcome anyways. We hope that all of you that are staying home, trying to stay safe, we thank you so much for tuning in to us today. And we just pray that in this simple, simple time before the Lord, and we're calling it a simple Sunday before the Lord, um, that you just receive that gentle, sweet, every day, simple spirit of the living God because you know sometimes we make him more than what he meant his, himself to be we make him complicated we bring him down to this world rather than the fact that he sits in heaven and it's only by his amazing grace that our chains have been broken and they're gone correct why don't you stand and worship with us
song in itself is not 
his words. Can you handle this word? No one could express how much you deserve. The one we can pour. The one we can pour. All I have is yours. Every single breath. Because I'll give you more than a song, Lord. I'll bring you more than a song. For a song in itself is not what you have required. wanted the best for you, but he had to work with other people at times. And I'm speaking to someone here today. Jesus, he didn't intend for you to be put into a bad situation. He has only wanted the best for you, but what he's given you is strength. He's given you his heart to forgive. He's given you the strength to walk through it and come through it and be through it on the other side. He's given you his heart. He's given you his life. Today I want you to just hold your hands up and I want you to acknowledge that you have a maker. I have a maker and he
back in the house of the Lord. And um, they all said, amen. amen, as they sat down. Hallelujah. And our pastor is going to come up. some creative ways to worship the Lord last Sunday. And by creative, I mean you stayed in bed and laid before the Lord till about 11 o'clock. That's what I'm guessing. So I hope last week you had some time together with your family. Uh, we had to close activities for a weekend, but you know what? It's the right decision. We have to be responsible and do what God's called us to do, which is to take care of the flock. Can you say amen? So I am glad to be back this morning. Turn to your neighbor and say, you're the best looking Christian I've seen in two weeks. Even with a mask on, you're still the best-looking person I've seen in two weeks. 
So I'm excited about what God is doing. How many of you had a great week in the Lord? Say amen. amen. How many of you had a few challenges? Yeah, we get them. How many of you had all of that in one week? It's pretty normal. That's, you know what we call that? Life. That's what we call life. You get ups and downs. And the beautiful thing is that God is consistent and God is in control. Can you say amen? amen. All right, well, we're going to jump into the Word this morning. Just a couple of things. We're not going to have fellowship afterwards. We felt like we would need to take one more Sunday to just be a little bit more cautious. So um, if you want to take your pastor out to lunch, that's fine. But we're not going to have fellowship in the fellowship hall. Uh, we're going to give you guys some space today and let you spend time with your family. Besides, it's rainy and crappy outside, and it's a perfect afternoon to go home and take a nap. That's exactly right. See, Jesus took naps. I take naps. I'm just like Jesus. <laughs> not really. He was taller and much better looking. Let's get into the word this morning. Father, I thank you for your goodness. I thank you for what an amazing group of people at the storehouse, Lord. I just love their faithfulness. I love their passion uh, for the Lord. I love their passion for each other. I love the way we watch out for each other and, and call and encourage each other, Lord. And I just pray today for those watching uh, via live stream, Lord, that the anointing would be upon this broadcast, Lord, that they would sense the presence of the Lord as we do here in Amen. service, Lord. Keep us safe and secure all week, Lord. Keep us virus-free. Keep us healthy, Lord. Keep our mind focused on you and the task at hand, which is to spread the gospel of Jesus Christ. And everybody said, Amen. 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 So in case you just dropped into this planet for the first week of your life right now, we have been in a series called Activated for just a few weeks. <clears throat> he says, tongue in cheek. So let's talk about what is the series all about. The series is about, say it with me, Unleashing the Spirit and Power, Gospel-Bearing, World-Changing Church. If that's you, say amen. You say, well, Pastor, I don't really have any skills. I'm kind of an introvert. I don't think I can do that. Yes, you can. You know that you, um, connected with the Holy Spirit, can do anything. Amen? Do you really realize that about yourself? You say, well, you know what? I'm not really good at speaking to people. Neither was Moses. Well, Pastor, I got kind of an anger problem. So did Moses. <laughs> you know, I, I, we can have all these excuses, but God wants to remove your excuses because here's what I know. You and God are a majority, and you can do anything with God. Say amen. amen. So there's hope for us. Yes. By myself, I'm not much. I can do so many things just on good old-fashioned talent, but you know what? It's not about talent. It's about hooking up and being anointed by the Holy Spirit. And then we can speak to people's lives and bring uh, relationships to, uh, together. And we start speaking Jesus and the gospel in their lives. And hopefully, 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 they see a difference in you from the rest of the world. Because if we're not different from the world, we're kind of missing a great opportunity. If we talk like the world and drink like the world and get angry like the world, I don't want that Jesus. Right? I want to know that you're so different because the Holy Spirit is in you that people say, I don't know what it is about that crazy co-worker, but I like him. Amen. We ought to be hope dealers. Amen. Right? We ought to be bringing hope to people around the world. We live in a time that is so discouraging that we need to offer hope. Amen. Yeah, I'm like Pastor Leanne. I stopped watching the news. Not because I want to be ignorant and bury my head in the sand, because I can't change it. And I don't want it bearing down on my spirit. Because the news I want is the good news. And you know what, folks? Our job as Christians is not to walk around and go, oh, woe is this country. Woe is me. They're, they're bad and they're bad. And be careful. No, our job is, to, you know what? I got hope in Jesus Christ. That no matter how bad things get, I am anchored on the rock of Jesus Christ. And he is unchanging. You know, we're kind of selfish. We think, oh, this is the worst time ever in the world's history. Really study some history. We haven't been, we haven't been thrown into the lions yet. We haven't been stoned or, or hung on a cross upside down or sawed in half. History's been a lot worse to Christians. We can still meet together in the church. We can still worship the Lord openly. We can still praise the Lord openly. We can still say the name of Jesus openly. They haven't stopped that yet. And when they stop that, meet in my house. I just redid my pool deck. The backyard is beautiful. We'll have church in my house. But we won't tell anybody. <laughs> so this series is all about being activated. 
activated by the power of the Holy Spirit. I hope it's made some changes in your life. You've been in it for 27 weeks. Say, oh, my. I think I'm going to die in this series. I'm just going to be my last series ever preach. I'm going to be preaching this till I'm 87 and a half. I hope it's made a difference in your life. Let's talk about some things that we've seen here. One of the things I noticed that I was studying uh, over the last couple of weeks is this. You know, we read the book of Acts, and we kind of read it like everything just happened day after day after day. But you know where we are today? We're going to start Acts chapter 15. You know that the, the gospel, taking the gospel to the Gentiles, has now been uh, an event in the book of Acts for over a dozen years. And we read this thing like, well, these guys got saved, and then Peter got Cornelius saved, and this happened, this happened, this happened, and it's like a week. 14 years is where we are in the book of Acts. And we gotta, you got to have that time frame, especially this morning. It's critically important this morning that we understand that, you know, Paul and Barnabas, they didn't just get on a bus and go to Antioch. I mean, they walked, and they took a ship, and then they walked some more, and getting there took weeks. And we are now, we are now... 14, well, about 12 weeks into the gospel being preached to the Gentiles. 14, did I say weeks? 14 years of the gospel being preached to the Gentiles. It's been over a dozen years. And let's think about that happening. It started with this. It started with Peter, who had this marvelous encounter uh, of the Lord, truly of the Lord, had this amazing uh, encounter of events that led him to take the gospel to who? Do you remember? This is a, this is a, a quiz to get you to heaven. Peter took the gospel to Cornelius, the God-fearing Gentile Cornelius. <laughs> what did you say back there? <laughs> so uh, Peter, through the remember, he had a vision. He had a vision, and the Lord visited him, and the Lord sent him to Cornelius. At the same time, Cornelius was having dreams, and there's this amazing encounter that brings Peter and Cornelius together. And Cornelius becomes the first God-fearing Gentile to receive the Lord. Then we read a little bit later on, we think it's like the next day, it's really years later, where revival breaks out in Antioch and Syria, and, and the Bible says that all of these, well, hold on, I skipped the scripture. So when Cornelius got saved, look at the reaction in Acts chapter 11. When they heard that Cornelius had gotten saved, the others heard that and all of their objections were answered, because at first they were in doubt, how can you take the gospel to the Gentiles? But after hearing this and the leaders explaining what was going on, through the signs and wonders. Remember, Cornelius got saved, he got baptized, and he received what? He received the Holy Spirit. So while the others heard this, all their objections were answered, and they did what? They began, say with me, they began praising God. You know, that's the appropriate reaction when somebody gets saved, amen? That's the appropriate reaction. The Bible says that the angels rejoice when a sinner comes home. Amen. So they began praising God. Yes, they said, God has given the Gentiles too, I love this, the privilege of turning to him and receiving eternal life. Do you know that what you have this morning is a privilege? Amen. God didn't owe you salvation. God owed us death. The wages of sin are death. But the gift of God is eternal life. He didn't owe us any of that. What a privilege it is to come to the Lord. So Cornelius gets saved. The church rejoices. A few, a few years later, a revival breaks out in Antioch, and we read that all of the Gentiles, that many of the Gentiles in Antioch got, uh, got saved. And so the church in Jerusalem heard about it. They sent Barnabas to go check it out. Remember this? So Barnabas goes up there, and we read his reaction in uh, Acts chapter 11, verse 23. So when Barnabas arrived, and he saw what? The wonderful things God was doing, he was what? Filled with excitement and joy. Y'all need to get some of these adjectives in your life. He was filled with excitement and joy. Why? Because revival had broken out. And not just among the Jews, revival had broken out among the Gentiles. He was filled with excitement and joy, and he encouraged the believers to stay close to the Lord, whatever the cost. You know, that's our job, to encourage one another. Stay close to the Lord, whatever the cost. Don't let people on the fringes fall off. If we see people, people are missing, call them up. Don't text them. Give them a phone call. People need to hear your voice. Better yet, knock on the door. Where you been? Get in touch with people. Stay in touch. Don't let the people on the fringes fall. So we see this uh, revival break out in Antioch. And then the third uh, event that Luke gives us is 
the salvation of Sergius Paulus, who was the governor that had a debate. Remember, he, his closest guy was a what? He was a magician, remember? So uh, Barnabas and Saul, Barnabas and Paul, they minister to him. They debate the gospel with him. And Sergius Paulus gets saved, gets baptized, and receives the Holy Spirit, to which everybody said, hallelujah. hallelujah. See, that's how it's supposed to work. So we've seen this, this, uh, this spread of the, of the gospel to the Gentiles over the period of about a dozen years. Now today we're going to turn the page and we're going to see something remarkable. We're going to Acts chapter 15. And I believe, I believe, this is the most important chapter in the New Testament. You say, well, that's a bold statement, Pastor. You're going to see why in just a minute. Because here's what happened. The Gentiles are getting saved. Are you with me? Still say amen. The Gentiles are getting saved. And at first, the Jewish Christian leaders are kind of okay with this because it's, it's kind of a, a small movement. And conceptually, they're okay with Gentiles receiving the Lord. <laughs> but guess what happens? Twelve years later, 14 years later, what was once a trickle is now a flood of Gentiles coming to the Lord. And nobody saw this coming. Probably except Peter. And, and not even Peter, he gets in trouble here. So Paul, especially, and Barnabas kind of see this coming. So now the Jewish leaders suddenly have this huge point of contention. And I believe this is one of the greatest, if not the greatest, most important chapter in the New Testament. So let's go to Acts chapter 15. Let's back up. I have a graphic. <laughs> Sorry. So this morning's title is, The Church Has Reached a Critical Crossroad. You're going to see this morning, it's coming time. This is really the culmination of the most tense moment in New Testament history. And we're going to dig into this a little bit this morning and show you what we're talking about. Let's go to Acts chapter 15, verse 1. Stay with me. We've got a lot to read this morning. Are you with me? Say, Amen. Yeah. How many of you need coffee? I'll send someone on a coffee run. <laughs> Samantha needs coffee. Go to Wawa. I heard they have coffee. So when Paul and Barnabas were at Antioch, now, you need to remember, this gets a little bit complicated, and we're going to be bouncing back and forth in time. This is like a time travel today, so stay with me, okay? So when Paul and Barnabas were in Antioch, some men from Judea arrived where? In Antioch, right? And started to begin to teach the believers, the believers that unless they adhere to the ancient Jewish custom of circumcision, they could not be saved. Mm -hmm. Say, that's not good. So Paul and Barnabas argued, now let me put this in, in reference to you, because this doesn't explain it quite as good as we're going to get into it. Paul and Barnabas argued and then discussed with them, the leaders who tried to stir the pot. Paul and Barnabas actually get into a fight over this. They argue with each other, and it becomes intense. And we're going to look at that in just a minute. I can show you this in the scriptures. So Paul and Barnabas argued, and they discussed this with them at length. With, with who? The leaders who had come to Antioch. And finally, the believers sent them to Jerusalem. Thank God the church did something right. They said, you know what? This is a critical issue. We need to send, remember, they're in Antioch. We need to send the leaders of this church, Paul and Barnabas, and we're going to send them to, uh, to Jerusalem to confer with the Jewish Christian leaders. The church now is about 15 years old. So they sent the delegation to Jerusalem, accompanied by some local men, to talk to the apostles and the elders, there about this very question. After the entire congregation had escorted them out of the city, I'm not sure if that's a good thing or a bad thing. I'm hoping that, it, I don't think they ran them out of the city. I think they, this debate was so intense that they're having this discussion all the way while they're going to the gates of this. You have to understand just how big this is. Two things I want you to see today. Number one, exactly what the issue is, and number two, the scope of this issue, because it is immense. It's huge. So after the entire congregation escorted them out of the city, the delegates, Paul, Silas, and actually we read later the Titus, uh, go on to Jerusalem, stopping along the way in cities of Phoenicia and Samaria to visit the believers, telling them, much to everybody's joy, that the Gentiles too were being converted. Pause there for just a minute. So they're in Antioch. Are you staying with me? Because I'm getting tired of it. The believers are in Antioch. Some, some rebels come in under the guise of Christian leadership. That's a whole other point we're going to make in just a minute. And they start this teaching that, hey, all of these Gentiles, that's great, but they can't be saved unless they're circumcised. So that's a huge rift right now. 
So they all decide to go, you know, we're going to do this. We're going to take it before the leadership in Jerusalem, and they leave to go there. Now, we know it takes some time because along the way, they stop and they minister in other cities. So again, they're not just jumping on a bus going to Jerusalem. This is a long journey while the debate is taking place. Are you with me? Say amen. Yeah. All right, let's keep moving. So after they get off the bus in Jerusalem that they did not take, they arrived in Jerusalem, they met with the church leaders, all the apostles and elders were present, and Paul and Barnabas reported on what God had been doing through their ministry. But some of the men who had been Pharisees before they got converted, we do know some Pharisees got converted, right? So they were Pharisees before they were converted. Uh, they stood to their feet and they declared that all the Gentile converts must be circumcised and required to follow all the Jewish customs and ceremonies. Mm -mm. Say, that's not good. Say, no bueno. Is that the end of that passage, Mark? Okay, so what is the issue? Let's define two things here. What's the issue? Very simply this. Nobody saw the floodgate of Gentile conversions opening to the extent it did. So let me put this in really simple terms. As the Gentiles started coming to the Lord en masse, all of the converted Jewish Christians who have now converted to Christianity but started, but still kind of clung and held on to their Judaism, decided that, look, all of these Gentiles, you know, that's really great. We never saw this coming to this extent, but it's really kind of great. But you know what? If they're really going to serve the Lord, they're going to need to be circumcised and follow the law. What? So this whole thing starts as some leaders come in and say, this is great, but guys, you're missing the picture. They need to follow the law. They need to be circumcised. What they were upset about was that Gentiles were coming in to Christianity but not converting to Judaism. So what is the issue? The issue is simply this. Is that our alarm beacon? Yeah, I like it. Okay, the bottom, very right bottom. Hold that in for about three seconds. Yeah, let's see what happens. Everybody, under your seats. Now, let go. Get it clear? Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so let's go back. We're in Acts chapter 51. Let's go. So the issue was this, that, that the, the Jewish converts, not all of them, not the leaders, we need to be clear. There was a group of, Paul actually goes on later on to call them troublemakers. There was a group of troublemakers, Jewish leaders, Christian leaders, who went to Antioch and stirred this pot. Here's the problem. They saw what was going on, and they didn't like the liberty among the Gentiles because the Jews were under so much law and so much order. But the Christians are what? We're set free in Jesus Christ. So this whole controversy comes up, and the issue is two things. The big issue is this. The Jewish leaders believed that the Gentile Christians needed to be circumcised and follow the Jewish law in order to be saved. What is the problem with that? And now what they've done is they've added works to salvation. They've made circumcision, listen carefully, a performance requirement for salvation. Do you see why this issue is so big? I wrote this down because I really like it. Let me see if I can find where I am in my notes. So the Gentiles, they were saying that the Gentiles needed to adhere to Jewish traditions do the Gentiles need to adhere to Jewish traditions to be saved? Well, it was one thing for the Jerusalem leaders to give their approval to the conversion of Gentiles, but could they approve of conversion without circumcision? Could they approve of faith in Jesus without works in the law? And could they approve of commitment to the Messiah without inclusion in Judaism? Judaism. They were insisting that without circumcision, Converts could not be saved. And this was important to them. Why? What was circumcision? It was God's covenant with the Israeli people. So circumcision is critically important to the Jewish religion and the Jewish leaders. But the problem is this. They were making, they were adding a performance requirement to, to salvation. They were telling converts, listen carefully, that faith in Jesus was not sufficient enough for salvation. They must add faith to circumcision and to the observation of the law. In other words, 
They must let Moses complete what Jesus had begun and let the law supplement the gospel. Do you see the problem here? It negates everything Jesus had done. So this is a huge argument. How big is it? Let's talk about how big it is. Stay with me. Say amen. amen. So how big is it? It's huge. It's, the, it's rattling the very foundations of Christianity. And an argument breaks out. So remember, this is happening in Antioch. So in order to fully understand just how big this is, we're going to leave the book of Acts for a minute. Say, we're going to get out of Acts. Yeah. We are. And we're going to go to Galatians. So here we go. Galatians, check this out. Stay with me. Are you with me? Because we're going to jump back in time. This is where we do a time war. So Paul is writing to the church in Galatia. Let me explain to you when this is happening. Paul and Barnabas were in Antioch, remember? Antioch, Syria, all of these regions around here are considered the lower parts of Galatia. So Paul writes his letter to the Galatians during this event. And we know that because history and commentaries and theologians believe that this is the southern Galatia uh, letter that Paul wrote to the church. Why is this important? Because check out what Paul says. Now, he's so he's in Syria, he's in Antioch with Barnabas, and they're on their way to Jerusalem, but this controversy is already broken out. You with me? So on the way to Jerusalem, this is why we know it took some time, he writes the letter to the church in Galatia. And he and he deals with this situation in the letter. And he writes this in chapter two. He said, 14 years later, I went back to Jerusalem again. This is his journey with Barnabas back to Jerusalem in Acts chapter 15. So I, this time with Barnabas and Titus came along too. I went there with definite orders from the Lord to confer with the brothers there about the message I was preaching to the Gentiles. Make sense? Keep going. I talked privately to the leaders of the church so that they would all understand just what I had been teaching. Now, again, these are conversations that took place in Antioch and along the way as he's heading to Jerusalem uh, so that they would understand just what I've been teaching, and I hope they would agree that I was right. And they did agree. They did not even demand that Titus, my companion, should be circumcised, though he was a Gentile. Next. I love this. Even that question would not have come up except for some so-called Christians. <laughs> The false ones. In one Bible translation, he calls them, except for some troublemakers who came into Antioch to stir up the pot. He says, who came to spy on us and see what freedom we enjoyed in Christ as to whether we obeyed the Jewish laws or not. They tried to get us all tied up in their rules, like slaves in chains, but we did not listen to them. No, no, no. For a single moment. For we did not want to confuse you into thinking that salvation can be earned by being circumcised and by obeying Jewish laws. So you see this is a controversy. It started over here. It's now on the road going to Jerusalem. Paul has enough time to write this letter to the Galatians because all of this false teaching has started up here in what's southern Galatia. Are you still with me? Yes, sir. All right. Is that the end of that passage? Here we go. Now, so stop there for just a minute. So you understand what's happened. Paul, Barnabas, all of this has happened. Now, what we haven't seen yet is just how bad this really got. This became a huge, divisive event in the New Testament. Paul goes on to explain what happened in Antioch. Now remember, Antioch is taking place uh, around Acts chapter 15, but during that, they're all heading to Jerusalem, and Paul is dealing with all of this between Antioch and Jerusalem. You still with me? So here's where it really gets tense. When Peter came to Antioch, because Paul and Barnabas were already there, remember? It said they had stayed there for years to encourage the church. So Peter shows up. By the way, after uh, Acts 15, we don't hear from Peter anymore in the book of Acts. So Peter came to Antioch. I had to oppose him publicly, rebuking him strongly against what he was doing, for he was wrong. What is Paul talking about? For when he first arrived at Antioch, he ate with the Gentile Christians who, who don't bother with circumcision and many other Jewish laws. Now, think about this for a minute. We're talking about who? Peter. What did Peter do back in like Acts chapter 11? What's that? 
he led Cornelius to the Lord, the first Gentile convert. So somewhere between Peter leading the first Gentile convert to the Lord and this, uh, this account in uh, Galatians chapter 2, Peter changed his mind. And Paul is not happy with him. Peter has now fallen into the false doctrine that Gentile believers need to be circumcised and follow the Jewish law. What in the world happened, Peter? He led the first Gentile to the Lord. So this is why Paul's upset. He said, but afterwards, now he, he rebuked Peter publicly in front of the body of Christ. Now this is contentious. You just see how contentious this is, right? This isn't like, hey, you're wrong, you're wrong. They punch each other and go eat chicken wings. This is the doctrine of Jesus Christ. This is the gospel of Jesus Christ. So afterwards, when some of the Jewish friends of James came, this is an interesting statement. Notice that Luke puts in there that, so stay with me. So this group comes to Antioch. Peter, they had already poisoned Peter's gospel. And now that group that we read about in Acts chapter 15, remember? This is the group that came to Antioch. And they associated themselves with James. James was one of the leaders in the church in Jerusalem. Peter, James, John, they were all leaders in Jerusalem. They were the pillars of the first church. So this group shows up and they name drop and they say, we're friends of James. What they're doing is they're dividing the church between James and Paul. We need to stand for what we believe in and not let people come in and divide the church. We need to, we need to not let people come in. I come in the name of Brother Chew Some Gum. I don't care. If he doesn't believe the gospel, I'm not following him. Because the enemy will bring people in your midst to divide the church. It's that simple. So it's interesting. They said some Jewish friends of James came. Now, how do they know? Because they said, well, we, we associate with James. We're, we're, we're with James. We're opposed to Paul because we're with James. Now, remember, this is taking place over some, a few years. So there's time for this rift to develop. So when Jewish friends of James came, now that he's talking about Peter again, Peter wouldn't eat with the Gentiles anymore. This is Peter who led Cornelius to the Lord. <laughs> this is Peter who went to Cornelius' house and ate with him and led him to the Lord. Hey, I know I'm not supposed to come in, and you're not supposed to have me in, but you know what? We're under, we're under grace, and I want to tell you about Jesus. And he walks in, and he stays with them, and he leads them to the Lord, and he baptizes them, and he receives the power of the Holy Spirit. And now, for some reason, years later, he's not even eating and associating with Gentiles anymore because the religious leaders have poisoned his mind and convinced him that Gentiles need to be circumcised and follow the law. <gasps> Are you getting all this? Yeah. You see how this is a big deal? So Peter wouldn't even eat with the Gentiles anymore because he was afraid of what these Jewish legalists who insisted that circumcision was necessary for salvation. He was afraid about what they would say. How many things have we held back doing for the Lord because we're afraid of some, what someone might say? You know, at the end of the day, it doesn't matter what someone says. Because at the end of the day, you and I are going to stand in accountability before God. And us as teachers, we're accountable for every word. We have a pretty heavy burden on us. Not in a bad way, in, in a just in, in an in a expectation. We're going to be accountable for every word we say as we teach the gospel. And we have to, church as a church, we have to be extra careful not to be so worried about what people think that stops us from doing what God's called us to do. Can I tell you that um, how many of you in here are pizza? See, you're not pizza. Not everybody's going to like you. Yeah. Not everybody likes Christians. But we have to stand our ground, and we have to know what we believe in, and we have to be unafraid to speak the truth with love and grace. Amen? So he was afraid of what the Jewish leaders were going to say. And then all of the other Jewish Christians, listen, so that everyone else, even who? Barnabas. Didn't just change his way. He became what? They became hypocrites. This, this is strong words. And then they became hypocrites too, following Peter's example, though they certainly knew better. That's the one reason why Paul writes to the church and says, who has beguiled you that you went back to this belief? 
Who has twisted your thinking that now you're thinking you can have salvation by grace in Jesus, but it's not just grace. It's you got to have that faith and you got to couple it with the law in order to truly be saved. This is a huge deal. Next up. When I saw what was happening, this is Paul's version still, and when I saw what was happening and that they weren't being honest about what they really believed, because Paul knew their roots, sometimes we got to go back to our roots, know what you really believe. Remember the day you got saved in the first year or so of salvation when you were in the Word every day and you were seeking the Lord and your growth spurt was the biggest ever and then life happens and you get busy and now distractions come and we're not quite as rooted as we once were. That's a dangerous place to be. God's called us to be rooted and grounded in his word. He tells us that in Colossians. So when I saw what was happening and that they weren't being honest about what they really believed and weren't following the truth of the gospel, I said to Peter in front of all the others, I love Paul's response, he is in Peter's face. You got to understand, this is, this is a big moment. And he says to Peter, he said, look, you are a Jew by birth. But you've long since abandoned any of the Jewish laws. So why all of a sudden, you who don't practice Jewish laws, why are you demanding that the Gentiles you led to the Lord are practicing the Jewish laws that you abandoned? That's not rocket science arguing. That's just, Peter, what are you doing? You're, it's the very definition of hypocrisy. You're doing one thing, and you abandoned being a Jew long ago, by practice, but now you're putting your requirement, not God's, your fictitious requirement, and you're burdening the Gentiles who were not raised in that culture, and you're expecting them to do something, by the way, that you don't even do. Paul goes on to say, you and I are Jews by birth, not mere Gentile sinners. And yet, we Jewish Christians know very well <laughs> that we cannot become right with God by obeying our Jewish laws, but only by faith in Jesus Christ to take away our sins. Isn't that amazing? What a great argument. Is that the end of that, Mark? So, you see, oh, and so we too uh, have trusted Jesus Christ that we might be accepted by God because of faith. And not because we have obeyed the Jewish laws, for no one will ever be what? Saved, Saved by obeying them. So you see why this is just a tremendously huge issue. Yes. It starts out over here with these false teachers, troublemakers, who've decided to, listen, who've decided to mix what they are familiar with in their religion with the salvation by faith in Jesus Christ. And you know what? Can you mix the two successfully? No, you cannot. You cannot serve two masters, for you'll either love one and hate the other, or you'll hate one and love the other. And this is a, de a decisive moment, it is a crossroads moment in the history of the New Testament church. Because right now, they've got to make a decision when they go to Jerusalem, what is going to be the acceptable solution? Do the Gentiles need to be um, assimilated into the Jewish faith by circumcision and practicing the law? So it really comes down to some questions that I have. I think if we ask these questions, we'll start to think about the answer. So I believe the Jewish leaders needed to answer these questions. Is the sinner saved by the sheer grace of God in and through Christ crucified when he or she simply believes? Has Jesus, by his death and resurrection, done everything necessary for salvation? Yeah. Or are we saved partly through Christ and partly through our own good works and performance? Put your rocks down. <laughs> are we saved by faith alone? Or through a mixture of faith and works, grace and law, Jesus and Moses? The answer to those questions, you'll find out next week. <laughs> same bat time, same bat channel. We're going to learn some things next week. 
We only covered five verses today, but it's a lot. And I want you to I want you to ponder this when we go home for the week. I want you to look at the history of where the church ended up. This is a tremendously important rift that is taking place. So next week, we're going to see some really cool things as we watch how the church managed this situation in Acts chapter 15. We're going to learn some exceptional uh, conflict resolution skills, and we're going to learn some things about managing uh, disparity in the church. But I want you to take home some applications this week as you ponder this message. Number one, I think it's important for us to know what we believe. Second Timothy, Paul writes to Timothy in the second letter, and he says, that, Study and do your best to present yourself to God approved. A workman tested by trial, say that with me, tested by trial, nobody likes that, say it again, tested by trial, you know, it's the trials in our life that make us mature, right? It's the storms in life that give us deep roots, right? I read a story years ago about, how many of you remember the biosphere that started in the late 70s, early 80s? Do you remember that? So there was this area of the world where they had a completely controlled environment, and they grew trees, and they had waterfalls, and it was huge, and they had all of this stuff. But they realized uh, several years into it, towards the end of the experiment, that the trees were failing and, eased, and could be easily pushed over. Because the one thing they didn't have in the biosphere was wind. And without the storms, you don't develop roots. And that's what Paul is saying. Study to show yourself and present yourself approved to God, a workman who has been tested, tested by our trials. You know what? When bad things happen and bad things come upon us, our reaction shouldn't always be, dear Lord Jesus, why is this happening? I'm a Christian. I shouldn't be going through this stuff. You ever say that? Maybe not out loud. But I've questioned what God's doing sometimes. But here's the thing, church. It's God allowing situations in our lives that mature us. And the question isn't, dear Lord Jesus, sweet Lord, why are you doing this? The question is, Lord, what are you doing in me? What are you changing in me? Trials are going to come. Jesus promised us that. If we think getting saved is all about following the yellow brick road to heaven, you're on the wrong path. Right. Besides, it had some creepy characters, flying monkeys and talking apple trees. No. Trials are going to come, and those trials are what root us and ground us. James says it's the trying of your faith that works patience, and patience, when it is complete, works into maturity. You want to know what? You want to know why some believers aren't mature? Because every time a trial comes, they throw themselves on the ground and throw a fit. Temper tantrums, spiritual temper tantrums. You ever have a kid do that in the middle of the grocery store? I just I pick him up, spank him, and say, "I don't know who you are, but we're going to go find your parents." <laughs> My wife's like, "Honey, that's our daughter. You can't do that." No, I don't care. We're going to find her parents. She shouldn't behave like we're going to we're going to straighten out her parents. <laughs> and we have Christians who just throw these temper tantrums, and they never mature. I've talked to believers. How long have you been saved? I've been saved. I've been saved thirty years. Okay, you've been you have been saved thirty years. You have two years of experience repeated fifteen times. That's not the same as maturing. We can't just throw a hissy fit when the Lord allows trials in our path. Can you say Amen? Totally off point, but a good little mini sermon. So study to do your best to present yourself to God approved, a workman. Uh, tested by trial, who has no reason to be ashamed. Why? Why are we not ashamed? Because we are accurately handling and skillfully teaching the word of truth. You know what? I don't want to have a Bible study where someone says, well, I think the Bible says, or in my opinion, wow. one of my favorite pastors used the term a uh, he would call those the show your ignorant Bible studies. <laughs> show your ignorance. Well, I'm pretty sure somewhere in there the Bible says cleanliness is next to godliness. Yes, that's in the book of Second Chemicals, chapter 3. <laughs> and have somebody go and find that. We need to rightly divide and skillfully teach the word of God. If someone comes up to me and wants to debate and they, and they say to me, yeah, but I think this is how, I don't care what you think. In all love and respect, 
He's not, I don't care. It doesn't matter what you think. What matters is what the word said. Because my foundation is the word of God. You might twist it and you might have been raised differently, but let's go back to what the word says. So our first point, don't be swayed by others' doctrines or teachings. Next up. Wait, there was more. Go back. What? Did I not do this right? So know what you believe. What's the next slide? Okay, don't be swayed by others' people. I'm sorry, Mark, my, my bad. Don't be swayed by others' doctrines or teaching. How many of you ever got in a conversation with someone and they kind of knew the word, it was a little bit intimidating, and I love what this says. Then we will no longer be immature like children and say, I'm not a child. Not a child. Childlike, childlike is not childish. childish. Learn the difference. We won't be tossed and blown about every wind of new teaching. Listen, with the, with the advent of the internet and television and Twitter and Facebook and Google and what else? Instagram, everything that's out there. It's easy to find doctrine. We need to know what the truth is so that we're not tossed about and blown by every wind of new teaching. We will not be influenced when people try to trick us, listen, with lies that are so clever, they sound like the truth. See, if you don't know the truth, you won't recognize that something is sounding really close to the truth, but it's not the truth. If you don't know what the truth is, you won't know what the lie is. Are you with me? Say amen. amen. All right. Thirdly, I want you to understand, listen, as we're going to learn next week, it is right and proper to contend for the truth of the gospel in spite of the debate that may ensue. Literally, Paul and Barnabas argued publicly, and Barnabas was ready to go the other way. Barnabas was ready to depart and leave Paul. This was going to split the early church, this issue. It is okay for us to engage in conversation defending the gospel. Providing we do it in love, providing we do it with grace, and providing we always point back to the Word of God. Can you say amen? amen? And lastly, I want you to remember this. Be careful about placing self-imposed requirements on other believers. Amen. You know, that sometimes God deals with you individually about things in your life, but that's not necessarily for every believer to follow. God may say to you, you know what? At where we are in our relationship, I really would like you to get past this and let's move on to the next level. That's a word for you. That's not a word for me. God has dealt with me about things in my life that are personal things I've either had to add or remove from my relationship with Christ. But those are mine. They're not yours. And if we listen to the Holy Spirit, he will bring things into our life that are appointed of God. What we got to be very careful of is that we don't bring requirements to other believers' life because that's how we used to do stuff. It's what the Jewish people were doing, right? This is how you do it, but it isn't how you do it. See, here's the thing. We're under, we, are, we, are, we operate in freedom, not bondage. Not freedom to sin, but freedom to be who God's made us to be. And my walk with the Lord may look a little bit different than your walk with the Lord. But you know what? We follow the same gospel. We're under the same grace. I'm not out there flagrantly sinning. I'm not advocating that. I'm saying we follow the gospel with grace. And do not bring it. Well, you know what? In our church, we couldn't do this unless you could. How many rules and regulations do we have, not in the storehouse, in the church at large, that we've placed on new believers to be members of a church? I don't see Jesus taking in members. I don't see Jesus saying, okay, look, I'm going away, and the church is going to start in Acts, and once the Holy Spirit falls down, Peter, I'm going to appoint you, and eventually Paul, and you guys have to do a six-week course on how to be a new believer before you can join the New Testament church. I'm not making fun of this. I'm saying how complicated have we made it. When we had our baptism on Easter, someone said to me, are you going to have a baptism class? And usually I do. I'll be honest with you. I've taught baptism classes for decades, and I, one of my favorite things to do. But I really felt in this case, as we studied the book of Acts, everybody who got baptized didn't have a class. They got saved and said, hey, wait, there's some water in the middle of the desert. How convenient. And they stepped out of the chariot and got baptized. 
Because all that's required is repentance. Yes. <laughs> if we uh, repent from our sins, believe that Jesus Christ is raised and that is the Son of God, and confess with our mouth that God has raised him from the dead, you shall be saved. Yes. And the next step is baptism. Yes. Why are we making this so complicated? Now, I think there are some things we need to have in the church just to keep order in the church, amen? amen. But let's just be careful how complicated we can make serving the Lord. Yes. Next week, we're going to read how they resolve this issue. It's brilliant how they do this. And they come to a little bit of a compromise. I'm a little surprised, but we're going to read about that next week. If you want to read ahead, finish chapter 15 for next week. Let's be very careful of not, in, not placing how we've done things into other people's It's easy to take that with you when you go to another church. Yeah. Easy to take that with you when you talk to other believers. Well, we did, we never did it that way here. And we found that this worked best. And just I had a friend of mine. We would have a service on Sunday morning, and the service we, we would do something a little bit different, and the service was just out of the park. The Holy Spirit showed up, and I mean the spirit fell, and people at the altar, and the worship was just crazy good and, and everything so you know we tweaked one little thing and it was almost by accident and the danger with that is guess what next Sunday that becomes the new normal that's not what the Holy Spirit intended so we have to just be really careful are you with me say amen let's be careful about what we impose on other people I think especially young believers ought to be able to come to the Lord and be discipled and mentored but be able to operate in the liberty of being young in the Lord and they're going to make mistakes amen amen I didn't get it right my first 37 years of serving the Lord. <laughs> we need to have some grace with people. It takes some time to learn how to serve the Lord. Amen? So next week, we're going to get into conflict resolution in Acts chapter 15. It's going to be brilliant what you're going to learn from this. Stand with me. We're going to do a couple things as we get ready to leave this morning. Thank you for your patience. We got out a little bit early today. Say hallelujah. Hallelujah. All right. If... Um, if you have an offering today, if you're watching online, thank you so much. Two things I want to remind you. Please download our app. We have a new app. You can find it at the storehouse.church. There's a link there, um, and you can download our app. The app is really cool. If you're a first-time guest, which I don't say this morning, you can come into our first-time guest and download some information. Everything is on the app. It's really, really cool. Go back to the slide that says four ways to give and see if you can pause it there for just a minute. So we're going to take up our offer this morning. If you are here in service and you'd like to use a tithe envelope, you can do that. Uh, if you have our church app, you can give on the church app. If you want to download the Tithely app, you can do that. You can go to our storehouse website page. There is so many ways to give to the Lord this morning, and we're going to make that part of our worship. So we're going to conclude with prayer. If you have your tithes and offerings, drop it in that bucket on the way out the back door. And we're going to just pray the Lord's blessings upon you this week. If you need prayer this morning, I'll hang out here or we'll have some elders come forward. We'd be delighted to pray with you and uh, just ask God to meet your needs today. Father, we love you this morning. You're just amazing. We thank you for your presence in the service today. We thank you for your presence even online. Lord, I thank you uh, that you are t raising us up as a church and you're teaching us how to deal with conflict and how to deal with the truth of the gospel, how to recognize the counterfeit and stay consistently adhered to the truth. Bless our offerings this morning, Lord, as we give unto you as an act of worship. It is worship from our heart that we walk in obedience and give to you this morning, Lord. We give you all thanks and praise this morning in Jesus' name. And everybody said amen. 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 Two things before you go real quick. Thursday night, we are going to do just a Zoom on Thursday night. We're going to take one more Thursday off campus, not be here. So our Thursday night Bible study will be on Zoom. Our men's meeting is scheduled for this Saturday. Depending on where our COVID numbers are, we're going to send out a text. So look for a text, men, for the guardsmen meeting. And with that, we are dismissed. God bless you.